Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. Send us an email, jimandjoy at EWTN.com. Well, today we have Dr. Gracie Pozo Christie with us. She's the Senior Policy Advisor for the Catholic Association. You could go to that website. It's called thecatholicassociation.org. Simple and easy. She's absolutely beautiful doctor. Yes. We've seen her on EWTN News Nightly. Yep. And we were like, hey, she's going to be on our show. Because when we do our promos and we introduce her, we were excited. So we had... Um, she's at the crossroads of faith and science. And mm -hmm. that's what she's going to be addressing today. It's going to be wonderful. Well... Thanksgiving is coming very soon. Ready or and not. So we're, we're thrilled about that. And we'll be having 25 to 30 people or more, according to who shows up, but family and friends. And it's such a special time of, of year of giving thanks to Almighty God. That's the focus. What a great holiday. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving to God. And that's what our presidents told us, like uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln. If you read their declarations, it was always about, let us acknowledge the sovereignty, the providence, Almighty God, His power, who called us into existence as a nation. So if he called us into existence, he can take us out of existence. Mm. And that we should humble ourselves before God. So that's always the focus. Thanksgiving to God. And some people might be asking, why do you have a pumpkin on the table today? And Joy, tell us a little bit about why the pumpkin and what that means to our family gathering. Well, when everybody gets together, a couple of things that we do is we eat a lot. I'm sure like everybody's we families. We talk a lot. And two turkeys, yeah. two turkeys, Ham and, we so do, on, and we yeah. talk a lot. And then, so, so to keep the conversation, because you know, sometimes at Thanksgiving, maybe you haven't been with your family, the elections just happened, you're going to have some conversations, yeah. it could get heated. You want to keep it loving and kind and full of mercy and gratitude. Yeah. Well, we play a great little pumpkin game. And so, voila, this little cover is going to come off. And inside the pumpkin, we have notes. And we pass the pumpkin around. Now you've written their questions. Their questions. So you can get to know one another more fully. Mm -hmm. And some of our children have written questions. And so there's like 50 to 70 questions that are there. And the kids are all asking, are we going to do the pumpkin? Are we going to share the questions? And it's great to be with 20, 30 people and to hear these questions and to answer them. And it's really interesting. What are some of the questions? It's called, um, we always call it the getting to know you game. And the okay. grandchildren love it because they get to hear stories maybe about their parents and one another. What's some of the questions? So here, select three people present and share your favorite thing about each of them, which is a nice thing to do. Maybe you really, maybe you never told your father, gee, dad, thanks yeah. that you earned such a good living that we could be here. Well, the specialness of each grandchild. Right. Like when that, if that question comes up, I can look into the face of each one and speak about the aspect of kindness or passion or whatever it might be. And they love just to hear about that. Mm -hmm. What's another and question? And then this is something you about can make up your own developing virtues. Gonna... Name something you should not do at your age. Um, so that, that could be anything. What could that be like? At my age, I should not forget about taking my medication. Yeah, that, you my should heart not medication, do that. that right? Would be okay. Good. So it's just a fun <laughs> little family game. Other suggestions um, at Thanksgiving time is maybe set up a card table, put a, a puzzle on the table, and then people can come around and just kind of gather. It kind of doesn't work real well at our house these days because we have the little kids, and they don't get the whole puzzle thing. And so that pieces, pieces wind up going missing, and um, mm -hmm. that's hard to do for adults. And but if you don't have children around, it's a great And we're thing. going to be with you for Thanksgiving. So we hope that you'll uh, have us on as you're preparing your meal. We have Peter and Sharon Gagnon who are with yes. us, Vice President of Production and Programming, uh, Peter Gagnon. Mm -hmm. Their seven children are going to be on and with us. And their brand new baby, Emma. And they're speaking about... Um, faith in the midst of adversity. So with all this big family, Peter has survived cancer and he's going to be sharing with us. And maybe you have some adversity in your own family. And Thanksgiving's maybe not a time of, of, of lightness for you. Maybe it's the first time you're going through Thanksgiving, you've lost a loved one. Mm -hmm. um, maybe somebody has a very bad diagnosis that's going on. Maybe it's a broken relationship and pain. Um, so be kind to yourself. Remember, Thanksgiving is about your relationship with the Lord and thanking Him. And that serenity prayer, Lord, 
help me to change the things I can. Help me to know the things I can't change. Mm. Give me wisdom to know the difference. So don't do too much. Uh, take too much on yourself. We're thinking about you. We'll be with you for Thanksgiving. And it will be wonderful. And we survived a remodel again. Another one. We did. I'm really proud of you. Thank you were you. awesome and great. Mm -hmm. But remodels kind of stretch your marriage, right? Um, moving stretches your marriage. It was lots of fun. And I'm really thankful, first of all, that we got to do some stuff that we got to maintain our sanity mm -hmm. through it all, and I'm, I'm just grateful. So those are good things to be thankful for, and they will, the remodel will certainly accommodate uh, all the people that are coming to well, our Gracie house. Gracie Pozo Christie is up next with the Catholic Association. It's going to be a wonderful show. Don't go away. Lots more to come. We'll be right back. important part of our EWTN family and you know we would love to hear from you. If you have a question for today's guest, Dr. Gracie Pozo Christie, give us a call during this live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460 outside of North America. You can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email Jim and Joy at EWTN.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, I'm here with this beautiful Dr. Christie, absolutely wonderful. She's the senior policy advisor to the Catholic Association. You can go to the website, thecatholicassociation.org. And first, you are a renowned radiologist down in Miami? In Miami, yes. South Florida. So great. Well, Dr. Christie, we would love for you to tell our family at home your place of origin. Where did you come from? What kind of family did you grow up in to become the beautiful you that you are? Well, I was born in Miami, and my parents had been recently exiled from Cuba when I was born. When I was very young, we moved to Mexico, and I lived there with my parents and my brothers and sisters until I was around 11 or 12. Then we moved back to the United States. So although I'm an American citizen, I got to experience um, the beauty and generosity of the United States um, as, as almost like a stranger. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot, of, a lot of beautiful feelings in my heart for the United States that some people don't have who were born and grew up here. I bet your family does as well. That word exile mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. a, is a strong word. And as years go by and now uh, opening up relationships with Cuba, Tell us a little bit about the exile and, and what took place and that your, your family felt they had to leave. Well, Cuba became a very dangerous place and, um, and a place of no liberty, a place of that, that to this day is the only totalitarian state in the Western Hemisphere. Um, so many people were very intelligent and, and, and left, and the United States was very generous to take us in. So for us, for Cuban Americans, Thanksgiving is a very beautiful holiday mm. because um, we tend to think that as, as people who have really benefited very recently yeah. from, from, the, from the foundational beauties of the United States, we can really appreciate them. Yeah. And, um, and we're very thankful always. Yeah. So you're a wife and a mother. And tell our family, how many children do you have? We have five children. How wonderful. Mm -hmm. And, and what kind of medicine do you practice? What do you do? Well, I'm a radiologist. Yes. And my husband also is a radiologist. Okay. And we met in medical school. And we then had four children and we adopted our last child. Okay. So we're blessed both ways, biologically and through adoption. Mm -hmm. let's, well, let's unpack the Catholic Association. I mm -hmm. want to get back to the adoption of your child and the impact on you regarding the sanctity of human life. But tell us, what is the Catholic Association? What is the mission, how it's at the cross-section of faith and what's going on in the public square? So in the Catholic Association, we try to be a faithful voice for the Catholic Church out in the media. So we, we write op-eds, um, we do a lot of radio and some TV, and we try to give, um, we try to give that true voice of, of the lay people of the church who love the church, believe what she teaches, and, and want to make that beauty and that truth available in the media where so often 
um, it's covered up or it's misrepresented. So that's where we try to be, yeah. um, as, I, as we say, at the intersection of faith and public life. Right. Well, it's so needed. So media is, is the key area for you all and to speak. I don't know how many times I've watched shows um, and have said, wow, is that really how we speak about Catholicism? Mm -hmm. And don't we have a better representative you know, to kind of be there? Or maybe there's no representative at all. So tell us a little bit about your staff, mm -hmm. uh, who you all are, and what are the key areas that you're trying to address? So we are three women are the ones who, who, are, who, who have the public face of uh, the Catholic Association. And we think that's very significant because many of the things that the public uh, gets a misrepresented view about in, in the media about the Catholic Church is the way that the Catholic Church teachings affect women and family and marriage. Right. So we, we who understand the church and love the church and believe her teachings as women, I think are able to best um, you know, show, show the public what, what the church means when, when it gives us these beautiful ways of living our life that help us to flourish. Right. How, how has your organization affected and impacted the Latino community? Well, we try also, you know, with Latinos, um, it, it could be that the media is even, in general, more confused <laughs> about Latinos and the way that we, uh, that we live here in the United States, the things that we want, the things that we need. We're actually like everyone else. And, um, and, and sometimes we're treated as a big sort of solid block. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and as a, sort of a plug and play kind of, you know, all Latinos think like this and, and behave like this, and that's simply not true. Mm -hmm. right. So we try also to be, me personally, because I'm the Latino in the group, we try to be present at those spots again, you know, to say, no, 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 you know, I'm a woman, I'm a Latino, I'm a Catholic, and this is what the church means, and this is what it means to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was interesting. I, we saw you on News Nightly mm -hmm. and uh, you know, sharing about the election and what took place, and there were expectations regarding the Hispanic community, black community, everybody gets all broken down. And it was interesting, because we, we do tend, some of us, to think monolithically mm -hmm. about Latinos, or just Spanish-speaking people. Um, what happened with the Cuban vote in particular? Well, the Cubans' uh, vote, vote uh, went heavily for Trump, mm -hmm. and that had a lot, of, uh, a lot of good reasons behind that. One of them, of course, was that many Cuban Americans did not agree with Obama's policy in opening relations with Cuba and not asking for anything in return, mm -hmm. uh, anything in return for the people of Cuba who, who live uh, with, no, with no liberty mm -hmm. of any kind, that, mm -hmm. that, we, that we find the most, the most common liberties that we have are, do not exist in Cuba. So we felt Cuban Americans were, felt very betrayed. We felt that our brothers and sisters in Cuba had been betrayed by the Obama administration. Yeah. What are the key issues that you're dealing with when the media calls you? Hopefully they're calling you. So you, you speak to a lot of secular media? Yes, we try to stay, we try to, I mean, I love coming to EWTN, mm -hmm. it's home, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's family. Um, but we try, we try to, to, to be out there in the main, you know, as, as mainstream as we can get because that's where our voices are most heavily needed. Right. That's where we want to be able to, to give the right, uh, the right view of, of the issue, the yeah. correct view. So what are the key issues? What are they asking you for? Or maybe you're contacting them and say you need to hear the Catholic voice on this, or Orthodox voice yes. on this? So anytime, any, anytime anything comes up that has to do, that, has, that intersects with, with the way, with Catholic social teaching, um, then uh, we write statements or we write op-eds and we send them out to, to anybody that might be interested in talking. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and that's how we end up on, on, these, uh, on these outlets. And what is the response from the secular media? Before the election, before the election, did people want to hear what the Catholic Association was, where you, where you were surmising the vote was going to go, how people were thinking you were going to participate in the process? How did that go before the election? Well, the media is, all, is, the media is actually very interested because mm -hmm. the media, they, they do want to know what Catholics are thinking. I mean, this is, Catholics are the biggest group, uh, one faith group in the United States. We're, we're significant, we, we're significant and as voters, as, as players, you know, of any kind in the, in the, in the public scene. And, and the media is interested in knowing, and, and they're interested in knowing the truth, right. which I think is something that, that we present to them. Because we don't, we don't tell them the things they're already hearing inside their, their New York midtown bubbles, mm -hmm. you know? We're telling them this, what, what Catholics really think about these issues, how we really interact 
you know, with, with, our, with our faith and with our pastors and our, our bishops. Well, speak about your particular voice, what you're called to share about in the area of medicine, science, ethics, and the issues of today, because there's real coming together between medicine, science, our culture, religious liberty. What are you speaking to? What do you find? What's the urgent things? Well, so a lot of stuff that's been happening in the last few years has to do with science, with medicine. So, for instance, um, you've all been following the HHS contraceptive mandate. Mm -hmm. That's been a very big deal for us Catholics. And part of what's been happening there is that medicine uh, has been sort of reshaped for political and ideologic reasons. And so women's health has, has gotten this whole new meaning that, it ne that never existed mm -hmm. before, right? So women's health... Um, has now all to do with the avoidance of children. Right. And that's not healthy mm -hmm. from a medical perspective because it's only a healthy woman that can have children. It's an unhealthy woman who's infertile perhaps that, that has a difficulty that, the, that medicine can help. Right. But it's a, health, it's a healthy woman who is able to have this beautiful function mm -hmm. that we're, very, we're blessed to have, mm -hmm. which is to reproduce. Mm -hmm. So we, over and over this comes up. And, and I feel personally as a doctor and as a Catholic that we can't allow um, that ideology to distort medicine to that extent because people need from their doctors um, compassion and mercy and good care, not mm -hmm. ideology and politics. Mm -hmm. So a way that that would affect the community would be with birth control, right? Where it's mass produced um, and it's, you know, it's being put out there like, this is the magic potion and everything is great and wonderful. And there aren't complications, there aren't side effects, everything is good. When we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so how, when you say, well, birth control, the pill might not be good for somebody. A depot shop might not be good for somebody. Um, birth control, and how, how do they respond? Well, shock and consternation. Mm -hmm. And I'm always amazed because... Um, every day that passes, people get more and more obsessed with organic and natural and, you know, careful what you eat and mm -hmm. careful what you drink and careful where you stand, you mm -hmm. know, because you have to sort of always maximize the health, the physical health of your body. Uh, at the same time, they, you know, they're promoting the taking of a, mm -hmm. of a, of a, contra of a hormonal contraceptive. Mm -hmm. um, and if you follow their, their ideas, you'll do that from the age of 16 to 46. Right. You know, that's a long time to mm -hmm. be, to be, you know, flooding your body with, with drugs. This is so unnatural. Mm -hmm. yeah. Where do we stand at this point with the Affordable Care Act, the HHS mandate that you will insure people for contraception and for abortifacient drugs? Mm -hmm. um, is, are there different possibilities now with that mandate now that we have possibly, well, we will have a new administration. Mm -hmm. um, so wh what do you see, if any, hope because right now where things stand in so many cases is you will participate. So we're waiting for courts to decide that. Uh, what could possibly change and, and how might that change? So we have a moment now in, in American history of tremendous opportunity. Mm -hmm. We can reverse a lot of what's been going on. Uh, first of all, a, our next Supreme Court justice uh, who will uh, replace uh, Scalia, right. if he's a conservative, immediately some of these suits um, to, make, to make the nuns the Little Sisters of the Poor, mm -hmm. for instance, probably those will drop out of existence because they will see that they can't win those suits in the court, number one. Number two, um, a lot of these rules are not laws. They were simply written in by the Health and Human Services Secretary and just so as easily as... A lot of these rules are not laws. Right. That's important. So that's a little bit different than the suits, the lawsuits, um, because why? A president can influence that? Okay, so... So many of these things that we as, as Americans really who, who are interested in our personal liberties find objectionable are not part of the law itself. Okay. They are rules written in at the discretion of the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just the same way that she wrote the rule in, the rule can be, can be written out right. of the law. Mm -hmm. So it's only at the discretion of the secretary who will be appointed by our new president. And what are those rules? What are the two key rules? Was well, for instance, rules? the rule that mandated that contraceptives had to be covered by every employer uh, free okay. without mm -hmm. a copay. Mm -hmm. So that was the one that, that's threatened so many Catholic institutions mm -hmm. right. um, who try to live their, la her, their faith, their faith uh, properly in the public square. 
And there's another rule that's caused a lot of consternation, which is Section 1557, that has to do with uh, gender and uh, discrimination on the basis of gender. This has been already used by the ACLU, for instance, to uh, sue Catholic, a Catholic health system in Minnesota to have them uh, perform abortions and, and, give, and sterilizations, if mm -hmm. you can believe it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, share further about this gender issue and question. That's part of the mandate? or part. part okay. That, this, okay, so this was written in into that same uh, Affordable Health Care Act. Okay. Explain it. What is it? Okay, it's a, set, it's a rule, a, a short rule. Called, uh, just, What's it mandating? What is it telling maybe physicians and others that they have to do? Or okay, institutions? It's, it's very vague, but it says that a hospital uh, cannot discriminate against a woman or a transgendered person on the basis of their sex or gender or perceived gender. Right. Gender. <laughs> so it's a vague law, but it can be used against hospital systems to make sure that they uh, perform certain certain things like sterilizations, for instance, yeah. or transgender surgeries, um, whether or not they believe that that's good for the patient or whether or not it uh, is, is a barrier to their religious freedom and right. the expression of the religious freedom. So this right. is saying, as a doctor, you would have to perform this particular request and this service, even though you believe it's not in the best health interest, that this is not required in any way, or it's a violation of my own religious view, this is a rule that is saying it's mandating you will comply with this. Yes, so as you said, it, it violates the clinical uh, judgment of the physician, and it also violates the liberty, uh, religious or conscience liberty, of a hospital system in deciding which procedures they will perform and which they feel they don't wish to perform for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So technically, like hospitals, Catholic hospitals, wouldn't perform sterilization because it's against their belief, right? And so if someone wanted to be sterile, have a vasectomy, or, you know, they would have to go to a, another yeah. hospital, sure. right, and have that done, or an outpatient kind of situation where they would do that. But so now they're saying that you would have to perform abortions at your Catholic hospital. You would also have to do sterilization for men and women at your Catholic hospital. Right. And then if they don't, then what? Well, they're calling it discrimination, mm -hmm. which is a really huge leap. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, if you don't do sterilizations on men or women, well, who exactly are you discriminating against? Right. They say, well, you're discriminating against women. But that doesn't make a lot of sense, logically, mm -hmm. because it's being applied evenly to right. both to both genders or both sexes. Yeah. yeah. So but it's it's a it's just an armament. It's a it's a rough it's a rough tool that's going to be used against religious liberty. Mm -hmm. So administrations matter, decisions matter, mm -hmm. because some of this can be reversed in terms of the rules or in terms of appointments to the court, and it gives a whole other kind of philosophical view of, of human rights, of religious rights, of conscience rights. So it's a critical, critical time. Well, look, saying. a lot of these positions um, in, in, in government in Washington are immediately, January 1st, going to be filled with pro-life people. Mm -hmm. People of conscience who understand our worldview and who can say, wait a second, that, that made a lot of sense when you're only looking at it from one perspective, but now we can look at it from, from the perspective of someone who understands the dignity of life mm -hmm. and what that means. And right. we can make a better rule or we can modify this rule. Where they would hopefully have to be asked to compromise, go against their belief system as, as they practice their medicine. You know, there is a... There is um, a fear, you know, that just because of the election, how things went, you know, we can rest now. It's all going to be okay. Are you saying that? No, I'm no. not at all. <laughs> no, I, I say that there is great opportunity mm -hmm. for us. There's opportunity for us. Now we have to make sure, you know, we, we have a lot of power. We're voters. We, we're constituents. We need to pick up our phones. We mm -hmm. need to, to make a fuss and say, you know, we waited a long time. We waited eight years. Let's, let's hear some pro-life um, pro-dignity um, stuff coming out of Washington. Let's mm -hmm. do it. Right. Well, let's pause here. Dr. Christie is here with us. We want to hear from you. We'll be right back. Don't go away.
Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for Dr. Christie, give us a call during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. Outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, and hopefully we will use your question right here on the air. Well, Dr. Christie, speaking about the Catholic Association, your particular role within it, um, and so many major issues involved this, this intersection between faith and science and medicine. We've not mentioned at this point this whole area seems to be expanding of, of doctor-assisted suicide mm -hmm. in, in youth in Asia, huge in Canada, the Netherlands for many, many years, and now in the United States of America seems to be spreading. Could you speak to this, why this is wrong, why this is an evil, why this isn't medicine, how you see things? Okay, well this is wrong in so many, on so many levels, mm -hmm. um, and we could talk about it for an hour. Uh, it's a really... Don't you care? Aren't you compassionate? Mm. Oh. I mean, don't you get that? I mean, yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's terrible to turn compassion on its head mm. and say that the elimination of the patient is, is a solution for the pain of the patient. Mm -hmm. And it, as, as a doctor, uh, I, especially, I especially resent the fact that, the, that our, um, our profession is being co-opted into yeah. this ideology because it has nothing to do with medicine. Anyone can kill a patient. It doesn't have mm -hmm. to have anything to do with a doctor. These pills could be given out um, by suicide technicians. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I feel and I believe that the medical profession is being used as a cover for yet another assault of the culture of death. Mm -hmm. So they're using us to, to make it seem clinical and clean and, and compassionate. But there's nothing compassionate about suicide. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, on one end of life, it was abortion, yes. where doctors were abortionists. And, um, and you know, as a physician, you know, here we are, ending the life of an innocent human being and then now we're taking the other spectrum of life and saying because of whatever that unplanned pregnancy when so many in the our society say well abortion needs to be rare um, you know in, in special cases but that's not true abortion is birth control in our country yes, people yes. don't want to hear that or believe that but it is true mm -hmm. And, you know, since 1973, we have killed 57 million babies. Now we're taking it to the other end of life where now we're, it's mercy killing. We're doing this because we care, because we love. We're ending the suffering. So how, how when you speak, especially to the media, the secular media, when you bring up the truth about this, what is the response and, and how are people um, listening to you? Well, they, they bring up, you know, people on the other side, they bring up the usual things that we can think about. Well, when someone is suffering, to end the suffering, you know, is, a, is, a, right. is an act of compassion. But there's, a, there's, a, so, there's some things we know about suicide, uh, assisted suicide or physician prescribed suicide. We know that most patients who choose to go down that road aren't doing so because they have terrible pain or, or are in horrible physical anguish. That's not why they choose it. In fact, today, compared to the rest of history, we have tremendous ways of easing physical pain right. that would have never existed. Mm -hmm. uh, but patients choose that because they don't want to feel a burden to their family members, because they, they fear loss, the loss of control and of their, 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 the way they interact with, with, yeah. with people. So what's really driving them to suicide is fear. Mm. It's, it's sadness, it's despair. So if, if that's so, then what we as a compassionate society should do, should be able to do, is to, to, to fall, you know, to jump into that breach and say, no, you don't have to despair at the mm. end of your life. Yeah. We will be there for you. Yeah. you know, we will give you the companionship that you need. That's really all they need. It's such an incredibly vulnerable time. We had a, another physician on our show some time back and he got a terminal diagnosis. As it wound up, he wasn't terminal. It worked out. But he actually said, when I was given this diagnosis, he said, I, I got afraid. I got fearful. I mean, it's like a whole nother person. I was so vulnerable. I had never felt like that before in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, and to have an option or to have somebody in authority looking at you and saying, you know, 
we could take care of this or do something. It's so cruel to be at, in that state of mind and then to have this option presented to you as if this is a legitimate option. You know what's uh, another, another great cruelty that the assisted suicide movement is doing to our country, to the people of our country, is that suicide rates are rising mm -hmm. among young people. Mm -hmm. And they're rising steeply and quickly. And I'm not the least bit surprised. Mm -hmm. when, you, when the law in, enshrines suicide as a compassionate mm -hmm. response, a, as a good, as a noble end, when, when the law says that there are times when it's honorable to yeah. do away with mm -hmm. yourself, mm -hmm. no, you're going to have that teaching, you know, filter into the, into the minds and mm -hmm. hearts of people, and they're going to choose suicide mm -hmm. because of a broken heart, you know, or a bad grade in, in university. Oh, yeah. sure. And this is such a cruelty. Mm -hmm. yeah. George, well, I'm going to go straight to an email. Yeah. It says, we live in a highly relativistic society. We hear your beliefs are not mine. I should be free to do what I want, and you have to accept it. What can everyday people do to ensure our faith is not relegated to the walls of the church, but that we are allowed to live our faith in public? And this is from Amos from Butler, Pennsylvania. What a great question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's the question mm -hmm. of all time. Um, we need to, we need to sh push away moral relativism and say, that's ridiculous. There, there is a truth. There are truths that are accessible to any human right. uh, consciousness. There are natural laws that are inscribed on our beings um, genetically through our gen genetic code. And we don't have to wake up in the morning and say that two truths that contradict each other are both right. Mm -hmm. So. We need, to, uh, we need to take that assurance as children of God, children of the church, and say the true and the beautiful can yeah. be known, mm -hmm. and I'm going to stand up for it. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not simply a religious premise, this mm -hmm. respect for life, the dignity of every human being, um, the facts of science and, and medicine. I mean, that's not a religious thing. The second part of that question spoke about um, our faith being relegated to the walls of the church. Can you speak to oh, what see. religious liberty means, what the Constitution says about our religious liberty and freedom, and this whole uh, belief that, well, you know, you're free to worship. You know, it's the exercise of religion that we're kind of like worried about here. They don't say that, but that's what it seems to be. Can you unpack that for us? Well, as our society becomes more and more secularist, fewer and fewer people practice their faith or understand their faith, whatever their faith might be. So people are becoming less and less tolerant of those of us who are constrained uh, in the way that we interact with the world in the public square by our, by, by our understanding, uh, our religiously infused understanding mm -hmm. of what's right and what's wrong. So in our country, um, and again, as the daughter of exiles, as someone who came in from outside, um, in our country, we have had this, this tender regard for the consciences of men and women uh, from its foundation. And this is one of the great, great, great beauties of our country. If, if, the, if the United States falters in this, the entire world will lose, um, will lose in that because so many countries look up to the United mm -hmm. States and say, here's a country that has, that has maintained um, these beautiful foundational virtues and has known how to maintain them for two centuries. So the number one foundational uh, liberty that we have is our freedom of religion and conscience. And that means that when I go outside of my house, when I leave my church on Sunday, I don't stop being right. an integral person. Mm -hmm. I, my integrity, my conscience, I can maintain that everywhere I go. Right. That is my, my, my right as a human being and as an American. Right. Amen. We're going to go straight to another email. It says, many of my friends say they oppose abortion, except in certain cases, like preserving the health of the mother. I don't think abortion is ever necessary and have shown them medical studies that show the mother is hurt by abortion. They attribute those types of studies to political spin. How does someone present evidence, how does someone present evidence on such an emotionally charged issue? And this is Kelly from North Carolina. I think in, in issues like this, it's important to have the facts. And when, um, when people talk about abortion, for instance, for disabled children, for disabled children in the womb, mm -hmm. for instance, um, we, we have had doctors um, 
testify in front of Congress, for instance, doctors with 30, 40 years of experience taking care of uh, very dangerous, you know, uh, problem-filled pregnancies, mm -hmm. right? And say, say to Congress, I have never seen a case where it was the life of the mother or the child. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. It happens in a, in a theoretical universe, but I've worked at this for 40 years and I haven't seen it. Mm -hmm. So we need to always dispel these myths um, with facts, with statistics, and it, it happens that we have the kind of science right now, prenatal science and perinatal science, where you can take care of the mother and the child. Mm -hmm. no, we, we have that capability, so we need to always push back with fact. Right, and it's as if an adverse diagnosis, um, that becomes, that's the mother will, you know, that's the health of the mother, and therefore, because of this adverse diagnosis, she she should have an abortion. Well, well, remember also people have used the, the health exception to mean mental health. Oh yes, and that's emotional health. Emotional health, and mm -hmm. that's, a very, that's a very tricky, slippery slope mm -hmm. because even, uh, even distress at having to continue a pregnancy for a few more weeks or give birth, um, which is painful, but it can be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, even that can be used as, as a reason to destroy the life of the child. Mm -hmm. Speak to us about the Hispanic community, Latino community, and maybe that's too much of a monolithic mm -hmm. statement. I know it's broken down through various nations. What do you see happening in America, the impact of Spanish-speaking people on our country, in the church, the demographic, what needs to be done? You only have about four minutes. But, oh. but I'm interested for your insight. Okay, well, look, Latinos, <laughs> Hispanics are the ones having children. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is really important. So we're the rising demographic in the sense that we're marrying earlier, having more children, having children at all. Uh, so that's, that's really how that important. Happens, that you get that's more how that numbers. happens. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that's, um, that's important. Yes. It's also important that the Catholic Church uh, is heavily Hispanic in many areas. Um, in, in, place, in many places, the, the church is dwindling in numbers, and many, and, but in the Hispanic areas, it's surging. Um, and, and we bring to our parishes, we bring, we bring beautiful ways of worshiping, beautiful ways of, of, especially, you know what's beautiful about us is our, we have a, a relationship with the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. which, is, which is special. It's a little different, and it's and it's very tender, mm -hmm. you know. And mm -hmm. and we have we we have that to offer, you know. And and it's very important for the church and the bishops now at their conference in Baltimore mm -hmm. have made a special um, are making a special effort, uh, a special focus on this. It's very important for the church to not just welcome uh, Hispanics, but make the church yeah. uh, their home yeah. in America. Yeah. The church is really good at this. The church has done it before, and it and it continues to do so. And what if they don't? What if what if the Catholic Church doesn't respond to the Latino community? What what is happening? C can I answer that in part? Mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood will welcome your community. Mm -hmm. They're welcoming oh. your community yes. right now. Yes. Uh, different religious expressions yes. and meaning well will welcome that community. And there's various groups. If the church doesn't welcome, we'll welcome. That's my view. Yes. Here's a pretty example. So Archbishop Gomez in L.A. last year, they decided, he decided, he's from Mexico himself, mm -hmm. but he decided that the Catholic Church in L.A. would open the cemeteries to worshipers on the Day of the Dead. Mm. You no? Know? And that's a beautiful thing yeah. that mm -hmm. we do in Mexico. Mm -hmm. we, we bring, you know, we come to the cemetery and, and we, we remember, we pray, we remember the ones that we love that have gone on before us. Yeah. And we, we, do, we do penance for them and for their souls. And they opened the cemeteries and they said, let's, let's have the Day of the Dead mm -hmm. in the United States. It's beautiful, it's doctrinal, you know, it's part of your culture, so it's part of our culture. What do you want to say to our viewers today, maybe some, maybe our, there are viewers, maybe not. Um, I don't want to get sullied through being involved in social issues. You know, I don't want to. I'm not political. I'm spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say to them to encourage them regarding the whole and the integrity of the whole um, story of the whole reality? I know exactly what I would say. <laughs> I would say we are the last mm -hmm. thing standing. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Catholics, are, we are the last thing standing between our country and a complete commitment to the culture of death. Mm -hmm. So if, if that doesn't get you off your chair and right. down, down to the local Planned Parenthood office with a sign, I, I don't know what can. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are so important. 
our, our virtues, our, our way of looking at life is so important. We, we, we cannot be silent. So it's important that we know what we believe, right? That we value what we believe and then we tell what we believe to everyone, which is, you know, we have to do that because we can't shrink back and think otherwise the government comes in at you and then begins to dictate to you how you will worship and how you will speak. And forget about not being ashamed. Be tremendously proud. Right. Be so proud that you are the voice of, of Jesus of the gospel today in the United States. There's no greater gift to give anyone than the truth and the beauty of the gospel of life. Well, Dr. Christie, thank you so much for being with us today, for representing the Catholic Association, for giving us great hope. Thank you. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. important part of our EWTN family and you know you can join us live right here on at home you could be a member of our studio audience today we have people from all over in our audience all you need to do is contact the EWTN pilgrimage department by emailing them pilgrimages at EWTN.com or give them a jingle at 205-271-2966 Six. You could have met our guest today, Dr. Christie. You could meet Father Leonard. You could meet us. We would love to have you here. Well, right now, we're going to go straight to Rome to hear from Joan. Well, greetings from Rome to all of you at home. And we have some breaking news, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But I just first want to tell you, here we are, the day after the end of the Holy Year, the closing of the Holy Door at St. Peter's. Basilica, and it's been a jam-packed weekend as far as news is concerned. Saturday, of course, was the consistory to create 17 new cardinals for the College of Cardinals, members of the College of Cardinals, and three of them are American. Now, interestingly enough, the, um, the College of Cardinals today, as of today with the new members, has 228 cardinals, and 121 are electors, that is to say under the age of 80, and they can go into a conclave and vote. So there are 107 non-electors over the age of 80. But interestingly enough, theoretically they can't vote in a conclave, but they could be elected um, Holy Father. So now, as, as I just uh, briefly mentioned yesterday, we had the mass in St. Peter's Square, about 70,000 people attending. Then there was, just before Mass, the closing of the Holy Door by Pope Francis. Now, um, the breaking news today is actually this. The Pope yesterday signed his post-Jubilee apostolic letter, Mercy and Misery. And today, however, that was presented in full to the members of the press office and of the m media. And the breaking news is this. Pope Francis has ordered the extension of the permission he gave to priests at the start of the Holy Year of Mercy to absolve women of the sin of, ex, uh, of abortion, which, of course, is an excommunicable offense. Now, in the apostolic letter made public today, Pope Francis wrote, I wish to restate as firmly as I can, abortion is a grave sin, a horrendous crime, since it puts an end to an innocent life. But he also said, there is no sin that God's mercy cannot reach and wipe out when it finds a repentant heart seeking to be reconciled with God. Now, because abortion was such a serious sin and excommunicable offense, the matter of granting forgiveness, certainly in the past, was always in the hands of a bishop. He himself could hear the confession of the penit penitent or he could delegate this to a priest who was an expert um, in the matter. However, last year, Pope, John, uh, Pope Francis extended the privilege of granting, um, of, of absolving a penitent. He said this would be good for the whole year, and now he has made that indefinite. So what we see is now priests may absolve the sin of abortion on a permanent basis, thus carrying out Francis's vision, as we've seen all year, of a merciful church for those women who, as he has written in the past, 
felt they had no choice but to make this agonizing and painful decision. So the Pope wrote, May every priest, therefore, be a guide, support, and comfort to penitents on this journey of special reconciliation for faithful who have had abortions. So, wow, amazing stuff, a wonderful breaking story, but time's up here, so back to you at home. Thank you so much, Joan. What a blessing that lady is, bringing oh, us yes. so much information. Mm -hmm. So uh, the doors of mercy have been closed officially for the year of mercy, mm -hmm. but the doors still remain, in another sense, wide open, yeah, God's mercy. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and yesterday was a, was a very remarkable day. It was just a celebration of the liturgy, mar remarkable weekend. Christ the King of the mm -hmm. universe, we celebrated. And, uh, you know, the Holy Father, in making the year of mercy, we received so many graces throughout the year, having the opportunity to go through holy doors and receive indulgences. And this is our time now to bring that mercy to others. Yeah. You know, and I, I'm so blessed to hear and, and I'm praising God that he's extended now this, uh, this time of, uh, of, 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 of forgiving uh, of, or giving priests the faculty to forgive uh, the, the sin of abortion. You know, we do have that faculty here because this is a small diocese, but, you know, it's needed in, uh, worldwide and throughout the diocese, throughout mm -hmm. the world. You know, so this is a, a tremendous yeah. blessing, something yeah. to praise God for. I think as well, yeah. one of the things that the Holy Father has extended is mm. the missionaries of mercy, those oh, yeah. priests oh, that yeah. he called to be missionaries of mercy. Uh, so he hasn't concluded that. So Father John yeah. Paul. He's is, got a lot of work still to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he enjoys it. <laughs> Wonderful. So so go see Father John Paul. You know, you, yeah. He'll be happy to, uh, yeah. to hear your confession. And what did you think you, about yeah. our guest today, Dr. Christie and, oh. and the Catholic Association? Oh, yeah. And they're all women in that association really going before the media mm -hmm. and presenting the Catholic teaching of the church regarding mm. faith and, yeah. and morals as regards religious liberty, mm. uh, human life, sure. the dignity of the person, and how needed that is. Oh yeah, uh, you know, Dr. Christie is doing marvelous work and it's uh, very needed, especially in today's world, and advancing um, uh, life, you know, uh, and preserving life, protecting life. You know, Jesus says that he came to give us life and to give it more abundantly to us. and. And thank God for all the, the pro-life efforts, especially what Dr. Christie's doing, working in the media, working with politicians and all that, uh, a professional as she is, um, giving expert advice and opinions and things. You know, this is, this is wonderful. This is great. And, uh, and so we're so blessed to have somebody like that in the church. It's yeah. a work of mercy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and you know what we're reminded of in, the, in life, you know, in, in abundant life, is that we have life in Jesus Christ. This is the abundant life. And, and Dr. Christie kind of mentioned that a little bit uh, while she was speaking. And this is a life we have in union with Jesus as Christians. It begins at baptism. And Jesus gives this to us. We receive the mysteries of Christ, strengthened once again in, in confirmation to go out and proclaim the Lord's name and to defend the church. And, and so we have this life in union with him. So that's why life especially is so much more precious mm -hmm. because uh, at every stage of life, we are imitating the stages of life of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. from infancy all the way to uh, his uh, passion, death, and even his resurrection. You know, so uh, it's so so important that, that life is maintained and life is safeguarded. Yeah. Well, and mm -hmm. on talking about life, we had a great blessing mm -hmm. today. Yes. Seven years ago, mm -hmm. well, it was probably eight years ago, I had a mom who had come to me in an unplanned mm -hmm. pregnancy, and she had her income tax check and mm -hmm. she had a lot of money in her pocket mm -hmm. about twenty two hundred dollars well she came to the center and she was 19 weeks mm -hmm. pregnant and she was going to abort the baby mm -hmm. and so i met with her and we did her ultrasound and talked about the procedure that she was going to have to have which would be dilation and evacuation and went through the whole thing saw her baby on in the womb and everything and she says She's a, a Southern girl, and mm. she imitated me. Do you believe mm. it? She imitated me, and oh, she said, and New you Jersey turned accent. to me, <laughs> and you said to me, did you think about adoption? Mm. So she, she told yeah. the whole staff today. With the accent, New Jersey With a accent. good accent. She yeah. did God could even use a New Jersey accent. Yeah, yeah go right. figure. Oh, yeah. And so she chose adoption. She chose an open adoption where, mm -hmm. so she placed this beautiful baby, it was a baby boy, into the hands of a family up north that she picked out. 
and they send pictures every day. And so she came today, of all days, for nothing. She was driving by the center. Yeah. She saw my car in the parking lot. She came to the back door, buzzed the door, yeah. and came in just to say yet again, thank, thank, you. thank you. you. Thank you that she was told mm -hmm. the truth. Mm -hmm. Thank you that she knew that she was made for more mm -hmm. and that God had a better plan yeah. for her life and, and that this that. wasn't the end of the story. Yeah. And that, yeah, like the, the, your only option was to have an abortion. Mm. So he lives, she lives, everybody wins. There's a lot to be grateful right? for. Yeah. Father, why don't you give us a prayer and blessing? All right. Lord God Almighty, we thank you, Lord, for all the work you're doing in our lives, for the work you do uh, through uh, Dr. Christie and the Catholic Association. And God, we pray that you grant us increase in all our efforts to, to uh, give charity and to bring you glory. And may Almighty God bless you all with his strength and peace, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank may this be Father. the best Thanksgiving of your life. Remember, you're an important part of the EW10 family, and you're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.